In our previous episode, we covered the evolution of ancient Greek warfare during the two Persian invasions, but we consciously avoided talking about the Greek navies that played an essential role in this conflict. This video will cover the naval warfare of the period. Ancient Greek naval warfare was very closely related to land warfare, to the point where it can be seen as a natural extension of Greek land operations. The navies were always close to the shore to be quickly resupplied, and the standard ship formation in naval clashes looked much like a hoplite phalanx on a bigger scale. Each city-state boasted its tactics and methods, as well as slight variations in the types of vessels used, reflecting the highly independent and autonomous attitude of the ancient Greeks. At the time of the Greco-Persian Wars, the Greeks used the trireme, which according to many scholars was an adapted version of a Phoenician ship with two rows of oars called the Byreme. The trireme was a vessel ahead of its time in many ways, and a masterpiece of ancient Greek naval architecture. It significantly contributed to the defence of ancient Greece from foreign invasions, but also to the expansion of Hellenic culture and ultimately the establishment of the Mediterranean as the Greek Sea. Thucydides stated that the Corinthians were the first of the Greeks to adopt this particular ship around 700 BC. Up until then, the Greek navies consisted mainly of the Pentecounter, a vessel with one row of 50 oarsmen, which can be regarded as its natural predecessor. The trireme's average size was 37 meters, and its weight was 50 tons, which was big enough to cause significant damage to enemy ships, but also light enough to be transported by the crew on land if necessary. Most importantly, it was made out of pine and cypress wood, to be fast and agile. Its top speed was usually around 8 to 10 knots, which allowed the commander to ram enemy vessels with significant force. The ship was named after the three rows of oarsmen, who, contrary to popular belief, were not slaves but often Greek citizens. In fact, if slaves had to be used, they would most likely be officially freed first. Oarsmen were not tied to their seats and were armed, to be able to board an enemy ship or defend their own. Oarsmen in the top row were known as the Thranitai, while oarsmen in the second tier were the Zygitai, and finally the ones on the bottom of the ship were called Thalamitai. Xenophon mentions that Thranitai were respected by the rest of the crew because they were exposed to weather conditions and, most importantly, to enemy fire. Naval warfare at the time looked much like a land battle on the sea, since a trireme would usually try to ram an enemy ship with its bronze ram, the Envelon. It was 2-3 to three meters long and was attached to the ship's keel, often taking the form of an animal. Ramming was followed by infantry boarding and clashes. An average trireme had a 200-man crew. 7 officers, 170 oarsmen, 14 marines, called epibatai, 10 hoplites and 4 archers, the toxotai, as well as 9 sailors who were responsible for the ship's sails and general maintenance. It has to be mentioned that these numbers vary according to the strategy of each commander and the level of professionalism of the particular city-state navy. For example, during the Battle of Lada in 494 BC, the triremes from Chios each carried 40 hoplites as they relied on the skills of their soldiers rather than the naval maneuvers of their captains. Meanwhile, the Athenian navy, which was much more professional, preferred ramming as the primary technique for defeating an enemy fleet, and thus kept the number of marines much lower to be able to have more oars. Athenian triremes consistently had approximately 14 to 15 marines, since maneuverability and speed, which were valued naval skills for the democratic city-state, would otherwise be jeopardized. For the Athenian navy, the hoplites were drawn from the Zugite social class, while the archers, sailors and oarsmen were recruited from the lowest class of Thetis. 
The Hoplites mainly acted as a secondary weapon for the ship after ramming, and were equipped perhaps with the standard Hoplite armor and arms, along with grappling hooks for boarding enemy ships. Although it is also likely that they were given smaller shields and linothoraxes instead of bronze armor, especially Athenian marines. It seems, however, that the primary task of these forces was defensive, as they were tasked with the protection of the oarsmen, arguably the most critical group of the crew. The captain was called Treiarchos, almost always an Athenian noble from the Pentacosio Medemnoi class, the highest social class of ancient Athens. They were responsible for the ship's maintenance and operation, as well as conscription and recruitment, not only from Athens but other Greek city-states too, often Athenian allies. Also, the commander of the vessel was known as Kibernetis, and was usually an experienced seaman. The crew members in the Athenian navy were paid one drachma for their services on a daily basis, while also receiving food rations. In general, the funding of the crews of Athenian warships followed the democratic traditions of the city-state. Everyone was being paid the same amount. However, higher-ranked marines and officers probably received some bonuses. Athenian naval power owed much to Themistocles. He was the one who forced the state to build a fleet of 200 triremes in 483 BC, and also urged the people to leave Athens after the oracle of Delphi, Pythia, advised the Athenians that only wooden walls will save you. A small group of elders stayed behind and built a wooden wall close to the Acropolis, but were quickly slaughtered by the advancing Persians while the rest of the population sailed away. Despite the destruction of the city, the ships, acting as wooden walls, saved not only Athens but the whole of Greece at the crucial Battle of Salamis in 480 BC. The Athenian fleet was largely supported by the wealthy citizens of Athens in what was known as liturgies, a practice where the prosperous offered financial and physical aid for cultural, military, social and economic purposes. Finally, variations of the typical layout for the trireme emerged during the Peloponnesian War, mainly for transportation purposes, with fewer oarsmen and more hoplites or even horses, while artillery such as ballistas and catapults became more widespread during the period. Naval tactics developed to be more complex, with flanking the enemy fleet becoming a well-established strategy or penetrating with force at a particular point so that the enemy line would break. Naval warfare during the Peloponnesian War can be seen as a reflection of the two leading city-states' traditions. Sparta would rely more on the infantry's capabilities, and would prefer to quickly ram Athenian vessels head-on, since it was almost impossible to compete with superior Athenian maneuverability and their highly skilled oarsmen while Athens would attempt to flank the enemy fleet while infantry and ranged troops harassed the enemy. The Peloponnesian War also saw an increase in fleet sizes, with as many as 300 ships and 60,000 seamen being involved in battles at Arginisei and Agospotami. The trireme's most significant disadvantage, the incapability to be supplied with food and water for more than a day, caused a crushing defeat at the Battle of Syracuse, as well as the aforementioned Battle of Agospotami, when the Athenian fleet was caught off guard while trying to procure food for its crews. Thank you for watching our documentary covering naval warfare in ancient Greece during the period of the Persian invasions. In our next video, we will cover the Greek armies during the Peloponnesian Wars. We would like to thank our Patreon supporters who make the creation of these videos possible. Also, Patreon is the best way to suggest a new video, learn about our schedule and so much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.